All right, folks, we did it. We made it through Strixhaven. We're on to Adventures in Forgotten Realms. This is the crossover that everybody wanted, so this is fantastic. Uh, it's replacing a core set, so we don't have to deal with a core set either. So, all right, this is awesome. Let's go ahead and get on into it. We're doing some draft skis. This is going to be a limited guide to help get you ready for launch in a couple of days. This is uh, launching just shortly here on Arena. So let's get started. So uh, since it's repla replacing a core set, there's not as many mechanics, but there are still a fair few. And uh, Wizards is beating us over the head with the D&D uh, &D synergy here. Okay, uh, They're capitalizing on that crossover. So the first in, in biggest mechanic is going to be dungeons. Uh, you're going to see Venture on a lot of cards here. And we'll get into specifically how to use dungeons, what they do a little bit later. But note that that's going to be on all the colors are going to have ways to venture into the dungeon. It's a major mechanic, and I think it's one that's going to be supported after this set. The next one, like I said, Wizards hitting us over the head. Dice. Dice rolling. Uh, you got to have dice. You got to have dungeons. And uh, there's another one I'm pretty sure you can guess that's going to be here too. But there's a ton of cards that uh, that have dice rolling on them. This is, again, in all colors. Uh, there's also some colors uh, in this uh, in this set that manipulate your dice rolls to, uh, to give you better chances at hitting those crits, those nat 20s, right? Lastly, you'll see a lot of choose-your-own-adventure stuff, right? We're playing a role. So Orcus, of course, doesn't have named abilities, but you'll see a lot of those named abilities like uh, Cone of Cold or Chilling Grasp or whatever it's called um, across different uh, across different creatures. Frost Breath, stuff like that. Um, you'll also see a bunch of cards that say like you happen upon a pair of goblins or you walk into a tavern and it'll give you a choice. So a lot of modality, choosing your way through the adventure, uh, you'll see a lot of those as well. Up next, we have some strong themes as well that we're going to see. Equipment. You got to have your fat loot if you're in uh, D&D, &D, right? You got to have your, your magical items. So you're going to see a lot of equipment in this set. Um, in particular, white and red have very strong equipment, but each color has very strong equipment at Uncommon. Um, black also has some really good equipment cards. I think uh, uh, green has a very nice card called Ranger's Longbow. So you're going to see a lot of equipment as well. And yes, of course, we have to have our dragons. There's going to be Tiamat, of course. Um, there's a Planeswalker dragon, uh, Bahamut. Uh, and then there's five uncommon dragons as well. Um, uh, so that's going to be more relevant for us in, in limited on the limited side. In particular, I think the white and red dragons are very good. Um, and we'll talk about those when we get to them. And then lastly, treasure. Of course, we need our treasure uh, in Dungeons & Dragons. Um, you're going to see this, a lot of this in uh, red and black. Different ways to generate treasure, different ways to use it. So it gains, uh, gives other cards benefits when you use treasure mana to cast that spell. Uh, so there's a lot of treasure synergy there. Um, and this, is, of course, opens the way for like splashing and, thing, and ramp and things like that. So very cool addition. I think the way that they use treasure in the set is really cool. All right, dungeons. This is the big, big mechanic of the set. So first want to go over uh, how they work so you start the game with all three uh, they're not on the board you don't have to draft them uh, they're sitting off in exile land and whenever you cast a card that has venture on it or whenever you venture into the dungeon dungeon you just pick one of the three uh, to go into and you start in that room now you have to finish that dungeon before you can start up another dungeon you can't pick and choose and and bounce around in between the three. You have to finish the one you're in. Uh, these three dungeons that they've created roughly align to an aggro, mid-range, and control playstyle. So the first one up is Lost Mine of Fandelver. Uh, this is going to be more of your mid-range starter dungeon. Usually you'll go down that left path there, make your goblin your 1-1 one, one, uh, token there, uh, put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature, draw a card. That's usually uh, the play pattern with this. Now, if you're splashing or you have treasure synergies, maybe you go down the right side to get your treasure token, drain your opponent, draw a card. Uh, but this is a good starter dungeon uh, if you don't know what type of deck you're going up against or if you have a mid-range deck. Next up is Control, uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This one has seven different steps in it, but the payoff is huge. As you get deeper into the dungeon, right? You're scrying three. Um, you can exile the two top cards of your library and you can play them. So essentially you're drawing two cards. And then the big payoff is you draw three cards and you get to play one of them for free. So a huge payoff if you can get down into that dungeon or you can venture seven times. Now some decks are going to be much better equipped to venture. 
Um, so you'll have to consider that as well, not just if you're a control deck and, and you're playing for the long game. Last up is what I think is the most powerful of the dungeons. This is Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, so this is going to be the aggro dungeon. There's four steps in it. Essentially, it drains each player for five unless they start sacrificing and discarding stuff, right? But the payoff is you get a 4-4 four, four Death Touch creature token, which is huge. It's massive. If you can uh, venture four times, you get a 4-4, four, four, and your opponent has to deal with that. It's going to trade up because it has Death Touch, or it's going to barrel in and require a double block and kill both their creatures. So it's it's a huge payoff um, for, I think, any deck, but especially an aggro deck so that's one to watch out for I, uh, we'll, we'll have to see how good tomb of Anni annihilation is but i think it's the best of the three all right so we've gone through our dungeons uh we've talked about mechanics and themes up next i just want to talk a little bit about the the colors before we get into them so in no particular well maybe a rough order of what i think is most powerful but i don't want to uh stick my hat on that yet i think it's blue and that's just because it has a, a, a very deep selection of strong cards at common Evasive threats, good card draw. Um, it has decent interaction with tapping things down or charmed sleep, stuff like that. Next up, I think white has very, very good equipment for aggro decks, right? You have plate armor, plus two mace, uh, a delver's torch that allows you to venture over and over again. Uh, and then it has, of course, efficient creatures because it's white, right? In particular, uh, white has a cantrip creature uh, that gains life uh, and is a 2-1 for 3. So I think that's uh, you can suit that thing up. You've already gotten your value from it. You can go venture into the dungeon with it. Very good. Uh, next up, I have red, and that's just on the base of its removal. Uh, very strong um, uh, Dragon's Fire card. Um, and then also the treasure. Uh, so you can splash, you can ramp with it to get fatties out. It does have decent equipment, especially its uncommon equipment, Goblin Morningstar. I think it's incredibly strong. Uh, next up. Uh, green, good role player creatures, fair interaction. One thing to note with green, it doesn't get a fight spell in this set, but it gets two different instant speed bite spells, which is much stronger, much better. So uh, one's at common, one's at uncommon. Uh, so it's a good support color, I think. Uh, it interacts with the other colors very well because it, um, of course, you have your, your decent interaction, but it has a splashing potential going and grabbing lands. There's some treasure making creatures, uh, stuff like that. Last up, I have black. Uh, black, it just never gets great creatures in, in this set. I don't think is an exception to that. Um, but it does have very strong removal. Grim Bounty is an amazing removal card. One of the best uh, four mana sorcery speed removals I think I've seen. Um, and so we'll get into that when we dive into black. It's just that the creature support isn't there. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see how this set shakes out. Maybe if you're going into the uh, Tomb of Annihilation, you don't really need a bunch of creatures because you're getting your 4-4 uh, Death Toucher, right? All right, so let's get into the creatures. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about three standout uncommons, and then I'll go into the top comments for each uh, each color here. First up is the white dragon. Um, our blue eyes, by the way. Uh, it has cold breath. Uh, so you see those named keyword abilities, which is just flavor, but I think it's really cool. But it's a 4-4 flyer for six. It taps down a creature, and that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Now, if you played during call time, you'll remember Bergstrider, which was this exact same creature, but it was five mana and didn't have fly. Um, so I think this dominates the sky. It's uh, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, the effect is good on uh, when you're aggressive, especially good when you're aggressive, which is what white generally wants to be. And then it's also good when you're defensive. Um, so this can tap down their, their flyer and allow the white dragon to get in. So I just think it's a very, very strong card. Uh, next up, equipment is a major theme in, in white. Uh, so you'll often have multiple equipment on the battlefield, but plate armor, I think is incredibly powerful. Plus three, plus three is massive. Think about it. It makes your two twos into five fives, which is a huge creature that requires a big removal spell. For your two drop so if you can get one of these on the battlefield it is a little slow uh it's a three man equipment uh you have to pay three to equip it uh but if you can get onto the battlefield it's going to take over the game uh you're going to lose a lot of games to this card and i think this in particular this equipment is going to necessitate uh some artifact removal spells to be in your deck right. last up is our build around uh ingenious smith 
two mana for a 1-1. One, one. Uh, when it ETBs, look at the top four of your library, put an artifact card from among them and put it into your hand. So you're going to have in, in white, there's some different artifact cards like Glacier Gargoyle, um, of course, your, your equipment, uh, and then in red, there's a lot of equipment there, and then in blue, there's uh, some artifact creatures as well. So I think if you are able to build around and get a bunch of artifacts, it draws you a card. It's a cantripping two-drop. That also uh, gives itself plus one, plus one. Uh, you start amassing those counters on it, it becomes very strong. So I think Ingenious Smith, there is a place for it, uh, but maybe it's not the best card in every deck. But you can build around it. All right, top comments. First one is, and this is close, I have Minimus Containment, and the reason I have this over Planar Ally is because it is enchant non-land permanent, so this can get rid of artifacts, enchantments, um, equipment, uh, you name it, right? Uh, of course, creatures is what you'll mostly be using it on, but it operates the same way as kind of a Banishing Light or an, or an Arrest would operate. So um, it becomes, that creature becomes a treasure token. Now your opponent can sacrifice that to ramp out a little bit, but uh, if, if it's killing their dragon, it's still a pretty good deal for you. Next up is Planar Ally. The, uh, another reason this uh, Planar Ally I put as number two is because it gets killed by all the dragons. All the dragons are four fours or five fives in this set. So um, it can lose on uh, in the air, but if you can just swing with it a couple times, it's amazing. You can suit it up with equipment, it's amazing, and it's a very efficient flyer. Five uh, five mana, three, three. Every time it attacks, you get a little cantrip effect. You get to venture into the dungeon, maybe get your payoff. Uh, so that's huge. Um, I wouldn't want more than maybe two of these in my deck just because it's so expensive. And then um, it doesn't hold the ground, right? Uh, it, it's a flyer, it's only a 3-3 body, it's going to be outclassed on the ground, so it's, it's better in um, more of a control deck, uh, not as much as in a racing situation. All right, last up is Priest of Ancient Lore. So uh, white is getting a cantrip creature. Uh, there's a theme, a sub-theme in white to gain life for a benefit. Uh, so Celestial Unicorn is a 3-mana three 3-2 three, every time you gain a life, put a counter on it. So uh, this fits into that theme. Uh, there's also a white-green theme around gaining life and getting uh, some some benefits from that uh, but three mana for a two one draw a card gain a life what's not to love you suit it up with a, some equipment there and then it just goes to town for you so i think those are my top three commons in white and let's get on to blue uh blue is a very strong color with some very good comments but first up i want to talk about their venture card uh at uncommon eccentric apprentice you're going to see this theme a little bit too. So there's not only venture cards, but also uh, cards that give you a benefit when you complete a dungeon. So there's a 2-2 two, two flyer for three, which is already a fine card. It's a Windrake, right? You'd play this, you'd draft it. Um, but at the beginning of your of combat, if you've completed a dungeon, you turn their biggest creature into a 1-1 one, one bird with flying. So that means that Eccentric Apprentice can kill it if they have to jump, or it uh, removes the defender from the battlefield so you can get in for damage. So I think that's a very strong ability. Um, and I think it's just a very efficient creature that helps you venture. Uh, it's an evasive threat that your opponent is going to have to deal with. It really puts them on the back foot as far as defense goes. Well, next up, there's another cycle of class cards. So each color gets a class at Uncommon. I think the wizard class is probably the, the generically best. The other ones are kind of niche. Uh, and the Warlock class I don't think is very good in black. But Wizard, I think, is just generally very good. Uh, the first ability uh, is irrelevant, right? You have no maximum hand size. But all you have to do is pay a blue to get this in play. Um, pay three mana. You can upgrade it to level two, and then you draw two cards. So it becomes a divination. So then it sits there at level two until you have five extra mana floating around. And then it gets the third ability. Uh, whenever you draw a card, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So if you're in blue, you're going to be drawing a lot of extra cards already. Uh, so you're just going to get a ton of counters to spread around your different flyers. Uh, and it can get out of control very quickly. Uh, so uh, at worst, I think it's a, it's a slightly more expensive divination. But at best, this can take over a game. So I think that's a very strong class. Last up is the build around. I'll be talking about this one later, but Feywild Trickster is insane to me. It's a 2 2 for 3, which isn't a great rate. It's a gray ogre, right? But whenever you roll a dice, you get a, a 1 1 
fairy dragon creature token with flying. So every time you roll the dice, and you can construct a deck that just is full of dice roll stuff. So I think this card becomes build around -y, um, especially when you get more than five or six cards that roll dice in your deck. It just starts to get out of control. And there's recursive dice roll, creature, uh, dice roll creatures in the set as well. Top comments. So, like I said, there's a bunch that I could have put in here, but the, the top three, I think, in blue, the first up is Genie Windseer. It's a four mana, three, three flyer. When it ETBs, you roll a dice. Usually, you're going to get a scry two on average. You'll get a scry two, um, but sometimes you'll, you'll spike a scry three, and, and if you get a scry one, that's still fine because you're you're interested in the three three flyer for four, which is perfectly playable and limited, uh, and is a threat in the air that your opponent's going to have to deal with. Also, it trades with planar ally, plus it has an ATB effect, so a uh, very strong card. Next up, Soul Knife Spy, uh, three two for three. Whenever it deals damage to a player, draw a card. Now in blue and black, there's a theme to make your creatures unblockable, so there's a lot of different support for that in blue. To make a creature unblockable or make it harder to block, give it flying, give it evasion, tap your opponent's creatures down. So there's lots of different ways that this thing can get in. Uh, and when you do, of course, you get that, that card drop and it immediately pays itself off. Next up, speaking of die rolling, I think Pixie Guide is going to be very strong in this set um, in the right type of deck. Now, uh, the reason I put this three over some of the card draw spells that I'll talk about later in blue is because I think it's still a 1-3 creature for two mana that has evasion. So you can suit this up with equipment, which we talked about. There's a ton of it in this set. Um, so I still think it's strong, even if it gets uh, suited up with some equipment. But it also, whenever you roll one or more dice, you uh, roll an additional dice and then ignore the lowest roll. So if I were to cast Genie Windseer when I have a Pixie Guide in play, I, and my first roll is a 9, uh, I can roll again. Um, and that, so this doubles your chance of getting a critical nat 20 on, on your dice roll. Um, but it also really, really cuts down on the amount of time you'll get that low 1 through 9 dice roll. So I think this card's going to be very strong in the right type of deck. Next up we have black. So removal is the name of the game in black. Power Word Kill, a very flavorful, uh, popular, iconic spell um, from from D and D, is here. Destroy target, non angel, demon, devil, or dragon creature. Instant speed for two mana, just hyper efficient removal. Now the types are relevant in this set. There's a lot of dragons. Uh, there's demons and devils at rare. Uh, there's a few angels as well in the set. So that is something to think about. Um, but uh, it's still Super efficient instant speed removal, first pickable card easily. Next up, there's a sacrifice theme. Uh, there is a steel and sack theme in the set, which is great. Um, so, Skull Port Merchant, three mana for a 1 4, not a great rate, but you get that treasure token. So, it helps your ramp, it helps you splash. And then, two mana, sack another creature or a treasure to draw a card. And now, when black has all these different ways, to, to generate creatures or uh, to generate treasure this starts to become a card drawing engine for you if you need it to be so it's very strong i think in the right type of deck last up is the build around a death priest of merkel four mana for a two two not a good rate but gives all your other skeletons vampires and zombies plus one plus one and there are quite a few um in black now, it doesn't extend to, there's no creatures that I know of in any other color that are skeletons, vampires, and zombies, but there's quite a few in black. Um, maybe there's only one or two vampires, though. But uh, I know there's some zombies, and there's skeletons as well. Uh, and the second ability is also incredibly relevant. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, pay one. If you do create a 1-1 one, one black skeleton creature token. Now, that skeleton creature token becomes a 2-2 two -two because of Death Priest. And then it can just run into combat again. You can pay the one. So this kind of recurs itself and, and generates this overwhelming tide against your opponent. Provides value for your creatures to be trading in combat. So I think that's a very strong build around. Especially if you can get the other skellies and zombies and vampires to support it. Top three commons. Um, first up is incredibly obvious. I think Grim Bounty is a very strong card for mana kill anything it is sorcery speed which is unfortunate but you do get that treasure token and like we said uh, there's a lot of different synergies for that uh for that treasure in black and in red in particular so a lot of synergy there kills anything next up precipitous drop this is three mana for an enchantment uh 
Um, when it ETBs, you get to venture into the dungeon, so it provides a cantrip in and of itself. Uh, Enchanted Creature gets minus two, minus two, so it's going to kill things in the early game. But if you complete a dungeon, it gets minus five, minus five instead. So by the end game, when you have completed a dungeon, it's going to extend its usefulness and you start killing big threats as well. So I think that's a very strong uh, first pickable card as well. Next up, uh, I had trouble with this one. Um, oh, Wanty Fangblade. Uh, it's a three mana two two death touch, which is already a fine card. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, venture into the dungeon. Now this card discourages trading because it has death touch, so it trades up a lot. Um, but this will force trades, and it's also very very good on defense. Um, so I think uh, that this card is strong. Should be able to get you a couple venture triggers because your opponent doesn't want to trade their four or five drop for it, uh, unless your opponent, of course, just has another two two that they'd be happy to trade. But Black and blue have that unblockable theme, uh, so you can potentially use this to venture in multiple times and then leave it back on defense when you want to. So I think it's a versatile card, strong pickup, good creature at common for black. All right, next up, red, let's go over that dragon again. Six mana, 4-4 uh, four, four dragon. Um, the black and blue ones are seven mana, uh, and then the green one is another six uh Six mana, four, four, but the ability isn't very good. So that's why I've highlighted the white and red. Well, I think the white and red ones are strongest. But when it ETBs, deals four damage to each opponent. Now, it doesn't kill a creature or anything or interact with your opponent's creatures, but four damage is a lot, right? Plus, you have a four, four flyer on the field. So that's going to do some work as well. So I think that's very strong. Removal. Uh, Magic Missile, of course, another iconic uh D, D spell can't be countered three mana deals three damage divided as you choose among one two or three targets now there's a lot of different um smaller creatures in this set so often you can kill uh, a couple or use it to kill one and finish off another one thing to note it is sorcery speed so that's a huge bummer especially because you can't uh, respond to your opponent trying to equip something to a small creature and kill it but still very strong versatile spell Last up is there's card draw. Uh, there's card advantage in, in red. Uh, there's a lot of ramping. Um, there's a card where you draw two, discard one, and create two treasure tokens. Uh, but there's also chaos channel here. Four mana for a four, three, which is already fine. And whenever it attacks, you can exile uh, one, two, or three cards from the top of your library. Usually you can bank on, on getting about one and a half. And then you can just play them that turn. So if it's a land, you can play your land. If it's a spell, you can play your spell, so it just draws your cards, and it's a big enough body that it's going to trade for something. Um, and you don't mind if it trades for a 3-2-3 three, three drop or something, because you're still getting value off the card draw. All right, top three commons. First up, Dragon's Fire. Uh, two mana, instant speed. Deal three to a creature or planeswalker. Now there's some trinket text on there where you can reveal a dragon and deal more damage. Uh, so you can reveal your red dragon and deal four, uh, which may be situationally useful to kill opposing dragons or bombs or something like that. But usually it's just a very efficient instant speed deal three to a creature or planeswalker. Next up, I have Valor Singer. Uh, I think the commons in red, I'm just... I'm not very happy with the commons in red. I think it gets much stronger when you get to the uncommons. Uh, but Valor Singer is a stronger uh, uh, common. It's three mana for a two, three. At the beginning of combat, any creature gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So it becomes a three, three, or you can pump one of your other creatures. And so it, it continuously allows you to trade up on board. So I think that's a strong ability for an efficient body. And you'll get, and, and of course the ability stacks. So if you get multiples, this thing can uh, start pumping pretty well. Last up is Fairy Day's Fireball. So you got to have Fireball if you're in D&D. It's five mana, instant speed, deal five to a creature or planeswalker, and then you roll a d20, um, and then it can deal damage to your opponent as well. Uh, so it it's, uh, compares very uh, similarly to Chandra's Outrage, which is deal four and then to your opponent, uh, which you get an extra damage here to take down a slightly bigger threat. Um, there are the blue dragon, I think, is a 5-5, five, five, so we can kill that. But uh, a, the, I think the magic number of things you want to kill uh, or for toughness in this set is going to be 4. So it's going to kill all that stuff as well. So, but instant speed, which is very strong. And that's right. Up next to the screen. Venture. They have a very strong venturing uh, venture card, Wandering Troubadour, which is a 4-2 four, for 4, which is that's a lot of power. If you can get in some damage with this, all the better. 
Uh, at the beginning of your end step, if you had a land enter the battlefield under your control this turn, venture into the dungeon. So this is going to get you three, four, five, six triggers, venture triggers, uh, if it doesn't die. So it becomes a must-remove spell, I think, when you play it. A uh, very strong venturing card that's going to get you really deep into the dungeon, complete a few just by itself. Next up is they do have interaction, which is uh, instant speed, uh, bite spells in this set. Two of them. Uh, Hunter's Mark, of course, is very strong against a blue card. Uh, it can't or a blue deck uh, can't be countered. Costs only one mana uh, if you're targeting a blue permanent. Uh, but target creature you control gets plus one plus one. Then it deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So because it doesn't fight, you can actually use this as a combat trick. So if you swing your three three into their three three. You can pump yours, it becomes a 4-4, kills their creature in combat, and you can go kill their 2-2 two -two or whatever. So, very, very strong card, I think, Hunter's Mark. First pickable for sure. And then, of course, we have Big Dopes. Um, Purple Worm, I think, is is the best of them. Uh, it's 7 mana for an 8-7 Ward 2, which is fine, mediocre, but you can chump it. Uh, the thing with this is that if you're trading your creatures off, and you should be in limited, uh, you can cast for 5 mana. So you trade your four uh, on turn four, or you trade your four, do uh, four drop on, on turn five, uh, you can just cast an 8-7 ward two, and then this thing becomes almost impossible to remove because of the ward on it. So it's going to start eating your opponent or taking huge chunks out of their life, though. So I think that's a very strong, big dope in green. Now, top commons. First up, uh, I chose Spoils of the Hunt. This is another instant speed bite spell, three mana. Uh, and there's some trinket text in there, but maybe relevant if you have some treasure lying around. Uh, it can pump your creature uh, for each treasure mana spent to cast that, so a maximum of plus three plus O, oh, uh, and then it bites an opponent's creature, so it's not a fight spell. Up next, Owlbear, just a generically good creature. I don't think this is the second coming of Seraph's Packmate. What made Seraph's Packmate so strong in Kaldheim was that you could uh, foretell it for two mana. Uh, but it's still a very strong card with big stats. It has a trample. Uh, it's a 4-4 four, four for 5, and then it draws you a card. So you can't go wrong there. You'll play 3 or 4 of these in your deck and be super happy about it, I think. Next up is another big dope. Uh, I think I've been underestimating cards like Ravenous Lindworm, um, Honey Mammoth for too long. So Hill Giant Herd Gorger, 6 mana for 7-6, gain 3 when it ETBs. Just a huge dope. That's going to dominate uh, the ground, uh, and then there's ways to give it trample in uh, in red as well. So if you pair it with red in a gruel deck, uh, this thing can be a huge endgame threat. All right, next up, colorless, and then we'll start getting into the different uh, uh, deck archetypes. So for splashing, there's treasure that we talked about a lot, and then there's also evolving wilds. There are no dual lands in this set at all. So... Uh, one thing to be aware of in the past few sets we had you know a dual land sitting at the at the land slot which made splashing a little bit easier for us we don't have that this time so evolving wilds uh is going to be i think a higher pick uh and you're going to want to prioritize these especially if you're playing a third color you'll well i think you'll need evolve at least two evolving wilds if you're going to be playing a third third color Equipment, we talked about that, and we'll get into it more when we talk about the color-specific equipment, especially in that Boros deck, in the white-red equipment deck. So you'll be seeing that a lot as well in the color slot. And artifacts, there's not a lot of them, but I did want to highlight Iron Golem, uh, four mana for a 5-3 Vigilance, uh, and then it uh, it attacks over and over again, but I mean, it's going to trade with something. So I think it's a very strong card, especially if you don't have a lot of strong creatures in your deck, like if you're in black per se. Uh, it can be a good pickup. So, uh, But there's not a whole lot of artifacts um, other than Iron Golem um, that I'd be strongly considering. All right. First up, Azorius White Blue. So this is a dungeon venturing deck. Uh, you want to use the equipment in white and the evasive creatures in blue uh, to, to sneak over for damage. So the signpost in common. Hama Pashar. 3 mana for a 2-3, which is fine. Room abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time, which is massive, right? So instead of... <laughs> if you're at the end of the uh, Mad Mage's dungeon, instead of drawing 3 cards, you'll draw 6 cards 
uh, which is game winning. Uh, but also even on, you know, if you're scrying one, you get to scry one twice. If you're creating a one, one, you get to create two one ones. Um, so this, uh, is very strong, especially if you need a lot of venture triggers going. If you can trigger venture multiple times in a turn, this card is just completely insane. Delver's Torch is going to help with equipping, venturing, uh, and then pumping your, your flyers, right? So it uh, is just plus one, plus one for your creature, but whenever it attacks, you get to venture. And then if you have Hama in play, of course, you're going to be able to venture, get that rune bonus twice. And then Displacer Beast, uh, when it ETBs, you get to venture into the dungeon. It's a 3-2 for three, which is fine. And then late game, you can kind of recur it, return it to its owner's hand, and then to, uh, return it to your hand, and then play it again the next turn, venture again um, if you're uh, late game. But also... Uh, I think more commonly, you'll use that ability to um, have it survive a block against a big dope from green or to avoid removal. All right, some synergy pieces I also wanted to talk about. Uh, fly is the first one. It's an aura, um, but I think there is value in it because it gives your creature flying, which makes it evasive, which is what this deck wants to do. And then whenever it deals damage to a player, you venture into the dungeon um, so that you can trigger... Uh, your Hama, right? So if you cast this on Hama, uh, you have a 2-3 flyer, and then it's going to trigger room uh, bonuses twice. Up oh, next, Veteran Dungeoneer, just an efficient creature. 3-4-4-4 four, four, four is fine, um, and in this set, uh, it's, it's a little bit larger than most creatures. Uh, wears equipment well, of course. Uh, but then when it ETBs, you venture into the dungeon. Just a very basic, um, simple, common card that you're going to want a couple of in this type of deck. Holds the ground well, 4 toughness, Lastly, we talked about Eccentric Apprentice before, but it does Venture, it's Evasive, it's Flying, and then it gives you bonuses to help get your other creatures through um, through attacks uh, when you complete a dungeon, which you should in this type of deck. You should be able to complete a dungeon relatively quickly. Up next, Orzob. So this is a little bit looser themed. I was struggling a bit to find the synergies here, but it's more around dungeon completion than dungeon venturing. Uh, there's also a minor recursion theme on their, their uncommon. So you have Barrow in here. Uh, when it ETBs, you get to venture. It's a 3-3 three, three for 4, so Hill Giant stats. And then when it attacks, if you've completed a dungeon, you get to recur a creature, which is hugely strong, especially because black has ways to make cards unblockable. Right, Thieves tools we'll talk about later which would make this card unblockable. So you can just start recurring your stuff over and over and over again with your uh, enter the battlefield abilities on it or whatever. Plus you're venturing with Barrow in every single time. Or not uh, uh, when it when it enters the battlefield you are. Cloister Gargoyle, another completion bonus here. is just a three mana 0-4, which is unplayable. But when it ETBs, you venture. And then when you complete a dungeon, it becomes a 3-4 flyer, which is huge, right? It doesn't uh, tangle well with dragons, but you're in white, so you can equip it with stuff. Um, and then it kills planar allies or genie uh, wind seekers or whatever they were called. 3-4 uh, is a large creature in this format. So Next is Dungeon Crawler. It's a recursive 2-1 for 1, so it's it's just a playable card. A 2-1 for 1 is playable for sure. It does ETB tap, but that's pretty much irrelevant. And when you complete a dungeon, uh, you get to return it from your graveyard to your hand. So the play pattern is you play it on turn one, you swing with it, it trades for their two drop, and then later on, after you've completed a dungeon, you can bring it back. More synergy pieces here. First up, face reversal. Like I said, I was struggling to find a lot of uh, uh, synergy with this archetype, which makes me think it's not going to be too strong. But uh, Fates Reversal sort of fits in the theme of recursion, right? You're getting your disposable creatures back with their ETB effects, and you're also venturing, which is what Barrowin wants you to do. Gloom Stalker, I think, is fairly powerful. Uh, if you complete a dungeon, it gets double strike, so that means it wears equipment incredibly well. Uh, and then, of course, it hits for four once it's uh, once it has double strike as well. And all uh, on a fairly efficient body just for three mana, so Barrowin can get it back from the, uh, from the dead. Lastly, Precipitous Drop. We talked about this one, so I won't go into it again, but of course, very strong when you complete a dungeon. It's just a kill spell. Uh, and then it also allows you to venture. Next up, Boros. I think this deck is very well supported and it's very strong. Uh, I say aggro, aggro here, but I think it also has a very good long game because of the equipment. 
Um, but uh, yeah, Brunar Battlehammer, one of Drist's buddies in the novels for D and D. Uh, four mana for a five three, so it's already got good stats. Each creature you control gets plus two plus zero for each equipment attached to it, which is insane, right? You put a plate armor on Brunner Battlehammer, and he's a ten six. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate each turn, which is massive. It means you can attack with something that's equipped and then switch the equipment over to your blocker. Uh, just huge, huge for this uh, for this archetype. All on a very good creature, uh, so Bruno's a must-kill threat. Next up, Plate Armor. Talked about this one, but putting this on Bruner, it also has Ward on Plate Armor, so Bruner becomes even harder to deal with. So Bruner's a 10-6 Ward 1 right? Um, just insane. So you play Plate Armor on 3, Bruner on 4, you can equip Plate Armor to Bruner for free that turn. Ugh, attacking for 10 on turn 5. Next up, Goblin Morningstar. And this one I think is also very important in the Gruel deck, in the, in the red-green deck. But it gives your creature plus 1, plus 0 and Trample. And then when the ETBs, you get a creature. Now if you have any of those dice rolling synergies that we talked about, uh, or it I mean, over half the time, you're going to get two, uh, you're going to get your red goblin creature token and attach goblin morning star to it. Uh, so it's just a 2 1 trample for two mana, which is fine. And the equip cost is relatively low uh, for, for what you get. You put this on Brunor, and Brunor becomes an 8 3 trample because of Brunor's ability, which is gonna, gonna hit your opponent really freaking hard. All right, some synergy pieces. We'll see a lot here. Plus two mace, just very generic common equipment. I don't think you want too many of these. Maybe one, uh, maximum two in a deck if you don't have any other equipment, really. Uh, but you have like Brunor and some of, the, some of the other synergy things. But you don't want too many of these. The equip cost is expensive. Um, Dwarf Hold Champion, I think this card's going to be very important. Uh, it gets plus two, plus zero if it's equipped. So if you equip it with a plus two mace, it becomes a five, five. Your two drop. 5-5, five, five, which is awesome, uh, which is huge. So I think Dwarf Hold Champion is going to be very good. And it's also just a 3-1 for 2 that's going to trade up a lot on defense. Lastly, Armory Veteran. I don't know um, what to expect from this. It gets Menace, uh, which is really important because it means it can't be chumped. Um, but oftentimes, um, your opponents are going to have to double block your equipped creatures anyway. Uh, to kill him, but it's a 2-2 two, two for 2, and then it gets Menace when it's equipped, so you put that plus 2 mace on it, it's a 4-4 four, four Menace, it's a must-deal-with threat, um, and your opponent can't jump it, so very strong as well. But I think Boros is going to be nuts in this format. Up next, Selesnya, life gain, dot dot dot. I'm not sure what else this deck is supposed to do. It Like I said, this, uh, this set, D&D, is replacing a core set, so the mechanics aren't as in-depth, aren't as complicated, and we just have a, your basic life gain counter stack. Uh, put together by Trailisar, which I think is a fantastic two drop. Every time you gain life, you get to scry one, put a counter on it. It becomes pretty big threat pretty quickly. We also have Celestial Unicorn, which we talked about earlier when I was bringing up their, the cantrip gain a life creature in white, uh, which is going to be huge, hugely important part of this Celestia deck. Uh, but whenever you gain life, you get a 1-1 one, one counter on the Unicorn as well. And that'll get out of hand pretty quick. And then Lurking Roper, a 3-mana 4-5. Um, <laughs> kind of a goofy thing. Doesn't really look like just a pure green creature to me. But uh, very, very good stats for the cost, of course. 4-5 for 3-mana is huge. Uh, it doesn't untap, but if you're gaining life every turn, and we'll talk about that on the next slide, we're going to go over Synergy. Um, it's going to untap all the time, so it's basically just going to have Vigilance for you. Um, but yeah, this card is huge, must deal with, uh, and then it's also good on defense if you don't have an easy way to gain life uh, right away. All right, Synergy Pieces, Prosperous Innkeeper. Uh, two mana for a 1-1, one, one, so not a good rate, but uh, it gets you a treasure token, so it helps you splash, helps you ramp in green, which is, is good. Uh, and then whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life. So think about those last three cards that we previewed. You're going to be casting a creature most turns of the game. Uh, you're going to have 15, 16 creatures in your deck. So it's going to trigger all the time, over and over again, uh, and keep giving you those bonuses. Up next... 
is going to be one of the classes, clear it class. Whenever you gain life, you gain that much plus one instead. That's not super relevant, but the next ability is. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So every time you cast a creature, you're getting all these counters uh, out of nowhere, right? Your, your Celestial Unicorn is getting counters. Your, the, creature you, the creature you casted is getting counters, etc. And then if you have the mana, you can upgrade it to level 3, return any creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then you gain life equal to its toughness. So that's huge as well, right? You can get your Trey Loss or whatever that they killed and get it back. Next up is the Druid class. Whenever So this is only relevant to this deck for the first ability, but I think um, it's fine for if you want to get level 3 if you have the mana. But whenever a land enters the battlefield under control, you gain a life. So every turn of this game, of, of your typical limited game, you're either playing a land or a creature. One of the two or both, right? Um, that's most of your turns in any limited Magic the Gathering game. Uh, so this, combined with Prosperous Innkeeper, is going to ensure that you're triggering life gain every single turn. Uh, if you have Cleric out as well, you're just getting all these counters. Um, if you have your Sussex Unicorn, you're getting counters. And then, over time, if you want to upgrade your uh, your Druid class to level 3, you can get a big, fat haste land. And that's fine, too. Alright, next up, Demir. I think this deck is really cool. I just always like Demir decks. But this is... Uh, uh, fixated upon unblockable stuff there's some minor drain life themes in it but not really uh, it's mostly fixated around that unblockable part of it and that's emphasized by cridal of Baldur's gate it's two mana for a one three um, when it deals combat damage to a player they lose one you gain one they mill a card and you scry uh, whenever you attack, you may pay two. If you do target creature, can't be blocked this turn. To note, Cradle doesn't have to attack to get this effect. It's whenever you attack, you can pay two mana, and then any creature can be unblockable. So, talk about that Soul Knife Spy or whatever, the 3 2, when it hits your opponent, you get to draw a card. Um, there's tons of, of, of cards like that in black and blue. When they deal combat damage, you get an effect. So, I think Cradle is going to be huge in making those cards unblockable. Guild Thief, here's another one. It's kind of a, a self-enabling uh, um, part of it, but it is very expensive. So it's two mana for a 1-1, one, one, which is unplayable. But when it deals combat damage to a player, you get a counter on it. And then you can pay four mana to make it so it can't be blocked. I think um, in order to make Guild Thief worth it, you're going to need to get in with this card a few times before using Cunning Action. It doesn't really become worth using Cunning Action when it's ju just to deal one damage or two damage. Just spend four mana on that. There's a possibility you're in a board stall or something, and, and then it's useful. Um, but I think you're really going to want to be in this deck and be able to enable Guild Thief to really make it shine. Next up, Thieves Tools. I think this card is awesome. It's just a very cool equipment. Uh, when it ETBs, you make a treasure token. Uh, it's two mana. It's equip uh, You can equip it for two. And then uh, the creature can't be blocked as long as its power is three or less. So you put this on your Guild Thief. You get a few counters on it. Um, and then uh, you can switch it over to your Cridal or your, your uh, Soul Knife Spy, whatever the thing is, and start drawing cards, whatever you're looking to do. So... I think Thieves cool, uh, Tools is very, very cool for a card, and it's a common, so you should be able to pick these up late, if, especially if you're the only person in, in the Demir deck. Up next, so Drider. This is a little bit harder to enable because it's a 5-mana card, so the, there's going to be a board presence when you cast this, but if you have Cridal, uh, you can just pay 2, smack your opponent for 4, and then it's going to make a 2-1 uh, Spider creature token with menace and reach and that happens each time so you hit your opponent with this twice they're probably going to concede um it also trades with dragons uh, which if you need it to do that that's fine uh, but i think this card has a huge effect if you can get in with it get in with it just once it becomes huge a 2-1 with menace and reach is a real card so Drider's very good. Soul Knife Spy we talked about. Not too much more to say about that, but you'll play everyone that you get, I think, uh, in, in this type of deck. And then lastly, Horde Robber. Uh, whenever it deals damage to a player, create a treasure token. Um, so this is going to enable a lot of those synergies in black where you're sacrificing treasures or you're using treasure to, to, to gain an extra benefit on a spell you cast. Um, and it's a 1-3 for 2. 
Uh, so it, you can equip Thieves tools to it and then get the benefit from it as well. All right, next up, is it? This deck focuses mainly on rolling the dice, as you can tell by Farida, Devil's Chosen. Four mana for a vanilla 3-3 three, three hill giant. Um, Dark One's Own Luck. Whenever you roll one or more dice, Faraday gets flying and menace, so essentially unblockable, right? It's unless your opponent has two flyers. If any of those results was 10 or higher, draw a card. So that is massive, right? And we already know from Pixie Guide that we can manipulate the dice roll, right? So we can get 10 or higher a lot more. As you can see, Pixie uh, Guide is going to, uh, if you roll below a 10, you're going to be able to roll another dice. Or no matter what, you're going to roll another dice to give you another chance at rolling above 10 and drawing a card each time you do. Uh, which is, of course, going to draw you into more of your dice rolling cards. Also, the Barbarian class. And we're, we're mainly looking at the, the level 1 and level 2 abilities here, but it's very cheap for Barbarian. Whenever you roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus 1, and ignore the lowest roll. Uh, these abilities stack, Barbarian class and Pixie Guy, they, they stack. Um, and so it's going to provide the exact same effect that Pixie Guy does, allow you to roll the dice a third time if you have both in play. And then at level 2, whenever you roll a dice, target creature you control gets plus 2 plus 0 in Menace. So now all of a sudden your Pixie Guide's a 3-3 three, three Menace to go with your Faraday 3-3 uh, three, three Flying Menace, and then you're starting to hit your opponent for a lot of damage. Uh, level 3 I don't think is as relevant. Um, but we'll see how aggro is it ends up being, uh, which gives your uh, creatures haste. All right. Synergy pieces. We also talked about Feywild Trickster, but this card is completely bananas in this deck. If you're rolling dice anyway, why not get free 1-1 one -one flyers? Uh, and then when you roll more dice, they become 3-1 flying menaces with your Barbarian class. Don't mind if I do. Uh, and you just pair that up with, uh, with good blue commons that roll dice for you here. Uh, so this is uh, a one I debated putting at Blue's third best common, uh, but it's an instant speed four mana spell. Uh, essentially, you're going to scry two, draw two with it, which is Behold the Multiverse without the Fertel. So it's not as good as Behold the Multiverse, but there's some synergy there. It's a very playable card, very strong card. You'll play as many as you can get in most decks. Like I said, we're going to pair this with, with strong um, uh, dice rolling cards. Swarming Goblins. 5 mana, 4, 3, but when it ETBs, you're going to create some goblin tokens. And if you're re-rolling, you're usually going to get 2 of those tokens. So you get 6 power, 5 toughness of stats for 5 mana, which is a great rate. Plus, this is going to gum up the board, right? You're going to get 2 of those tokens to block. Uh, this Swarming Goblins is going to trade up. Um, or you can give those tokens or this thing Menace when you roll a dice with your Barbarian class. Uh, just, just awesome. Um, so you're just going to pair up those cards with some dice roll cards and go to town. Phrase it. All right, next up. Simic is ramp, big spells, big fatties, big dopes. You know how it goes. This is your, your typical MO for, for Simic. Uh, Gretchen here, two mana, 04, just a wall. Pay four mana, draw a card. Put a land from your hand into the battlefield. Um, you can do that at instant speed. You can do it multiple times. So if you have eight mana, you can do it twice at the end of your opponent's turn uh, if the game goes long. Uh, big spells, right? Sudden insight. Six mana, draw a card for each different mana value among non-land cards in your graveyard. So uh, you can get to a point where this is drawing you four or five cards. That's awesome. Um, it's instant speed. And so Simic is the type of deck that's just going to have six mana to play around with. Draw more cards, draw more big spells, draw more fatties. You happen on a glade. So uh, this is three mana for that choose your own adventure type card. You can journey on, get two basic land cards, put them into your hand, or return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Mostly you're going to use this for the lands, right? Uh, you're going to want to make sure you hit your land up, drops in this deck. Um, so you can play your big fatties, purple worm, and, and the hill giant herd gorger, gorger uh, that 7-6. Synergy pieces, Blue Dragon. Uh, this is this one of the seven mana dragons. I rated these a little bit lower because they're seven mana, but in this deck, I think this card is very, very strong. It's a 5-5 five, five flyer, biggest flyer at common or uncommon in the set. Uh, so it's just going to dominate the air no matter what. Uh, and then it also has Lightning Breath, which I don't think is super relevant, uh, but it can help you stay alive, right? One of the ways Simic loses is that uh, aggro decks get underneath them, and then before they can get uh, 
uh, their fatties online and get that board presence, uh, they die. So this is going to give a total of minus six, minus zero spread across three different creatures. Help you stay alive, help you stabilize. Arcane Investigator. So it's a two mana, two one, but uh, its ability search the room, six mana, roll a d20, you can either draw a card or look at the top three of your library, choose one, put the rest on, on the bottom. So it's an anticipate effect, if you're familiar with that card. Um, so this card, again, big mana to be able to, to do this, but Simic's going to have that because it's going to want to get lands, draw lands, draw cards, uh, and this just enables that. Starts to, to help you snowball. Plus it's a two drop, a two one that's going to trade off if you need it. Lastly, I have Loathsome Troll. Now it's a 6-2 for 5 mana, which is not good stats. It's going to trade for, for an Arcane Investigator. Uh, but if you have a ton of mana, uh, you can keep casting it and replaying it. Right For 4 mana, you roll a d20, uh, activate it only if the troll is in your graveyard, and then depending on your roll, it goes on top of your library, into your hand, or if you, if you hit a nat 20, it goes right back onto the battlefield tapped. So very strong, I think, in this type of deck where you have a ton of mana, where you might have nine mana to do this all in one turn. You know, you trade off your loathsome troll, you pay nine mana, you get it back in your hand and cast it. Next up, Rakdos. So this um, is, a, is a more complex theme, but I think this is very cool. So there's a lot of treasure synergy that we've talked about. Uh, this is a, a ramping uh, deck with the tre uh, treasure, you can do that, or you can splash. And then there's also a minor steel and sack theme that I'm going to show on the second page here. But the gold card, Kalein, uh, two mana for a one two. When it ETBs, you make a treasure, so it helps you ramp, helps you splash. Other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them for each mana spent from a treasure to uh, spent to cast them. So if you cast a three three for three, you spend it all with treasure mana. That becomes a 6-6. Six, six. That's awesome. That's crazy good. Uh, and this deck specializes on generating a ton of treasure. So you'll be able to do that a lot. Skullport Merchant, we talked about this one. Creates a treasure token. Whenever you sacrifice a creature or a treasure, you get to draw a card. Jaded Sellsword. This is uh, an example of some of the synergies where uh, creatures get powered up when you use treasure mana to cast them. So it's a 4-3 for 4, which is fine. It's a fine uh, rate. Uh, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, it gets first strike and haste until end of turn. Of course, if you spend four treasure on it, when you have Kalein in play, it becomes an 8-7 first strike haste, which is pretty sweet. But even if you spend one or two treasure on this uh, with Kalein in play, it becomes a huge, massive, hasty first strike threat. Next up, Steel and Sack. Love it. Price of loyalty is what this is going to be built around. This is at common, which is very important. You want to have your, your steel ability be at common, and then also common sacrifice outlets to help enable it. So three mana for price of loyalty. You gain control of that creature. If mana from a treasure was spent to cast a spell, it gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. I don't, I'm not really concerned with spending the treasure on price of loyalty. I just want the, their creature to steal. From that, there's lots of different sacrifice outlets. We went to, we talked about Skullport Merchant, but there's also Deadly Dispute. Two mana uh, as an additional cost to cast this. Sack an artifact or creature, so you could sack a treasure if you wanted, even if you don't have a creature to sacrifice. And then you draw two and create another treasure token. So for five mana, you can price of loyalty their creature, swing with it, beat them over the head with it, then sacrifice their, their creature, uh, draw two cards, and make a treasure token. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. All that common. Another common, uh, Sepulcher Ghoul. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. It's two one for two. Sack another creature. Gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. So you steal their thing. Um, beat them over the head with it. Sacrifice it. Super easy uh, kill spell. Turns price of loyalty into a kill spell. Love these types of decks. Next up, Golgari. Uh, this is a very unfocused deck. I'm not sure how good this is going to be. Poor Golgari. Poor green black. is never good. Um, but Shesra is their... Uh, signpost in common. It's four mana for a 1-3, which is atrocious. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, Wood Sheshra and ETBs, target creature blocks this turn of Babel. Pretty irrelevant. I guess you can set up something where you swing in with your big creature and kill theirs. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay two life if you do draw a card. Um, you have to pay two life, which matters, especially if you're pay playing out a four drop 
Uh, that's a 1-3, because it's going to mean you're probably going to be behind on board. Um, but uh, I guess it's a recurring ability. You can set up creatures dying with sacrifice outlets or removal spells or whatever uh, and start drawing cards that way. I don't know if I would play this card. Anyway, uh, Death Priest of Merkel. We talked about this one. This card is very strong. It's a build around. Four mana, two, two. Uh, gives your skellies, vampires, and zombies plus one, plus one. And then when a creature dies, you can pay one, make another skelly, which becomes a two, two. Purple Worm, we talked about this one as well. Very efficient fatty. Uh, one of the reasons I think Golgari is less powerful is because other decks are going to want Death Priest, and any green deck's going to want Purple Worm, especially the Simic deck, right? That ramps. Um, because creatures dying in combat is just a thing. So um, I think those two cards are just going to be picked highly in general. But anyway, uh, Purple Worm, very efficient, very strong, especially in the Golgari deck that wants to trade off creatures and things. Grim Wanderer, uh, two mana for a 5-3 flash, which is really, really good rate, of course. Uh, you can cast it only if a creature died this turn. So uh, you trade on your opponent's turn or use removal on where your opponent's creature during their turn. You can set up some combats where you flash this creature in, eat another one of their creatures, um, but usually they'll use it on your turn after killing their thing with a sorcery removal, and you get a 5-3. Uh, the problem with this card is three toughness, so it's going to trade down a lot um, for what you have to do to get it into play. I guess it's still just a two drop, but, you know. Zombie Ogre, five mana for a three five. It's got a big butt, so you got to give it that. Uh, if a creature died this turn, venture into the dungeon. Very basic, very simple. Um, for five mana, I think it's a bit overcosted for what you're getting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not much else to say about that. Uh, and then Bulat, I don't, I don't think this card's very good at all. Um, there was a Sabertooth Mauler in M21 or whatever it was, uh, last year's core set. Uh, that was this exact same typing, except it also untapped itself and it wasn't very good. So at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, put a plus one plus one encounter on Bulat. I, I just, it's a hill giant stats. Um, so I don't think it's great, but um, uh, you know, if you got to do it, you got to do it. Uh, it's playable. It's certainly a playable, especially in this deck. So, that's Golgari. <laughs> Gruel. Uh, this focuses around pack tactics, and it's a beatdown deck, and I think this deck is pretty strong. Especially, it's it's made much stronger by the uh, card Goblin Morningstar that we talked about. But, all right, Targdar is going to be your signpost in common. Pack tactics. So, this ability is if you attack with a creature with pack tactics, and the total power of of creatures you've attacked with is six or greater, uh, you get an effect. In this case, all attacking creatures get plus one, plus zero. Uh, and then for four mana, you can double its power and toughness. So for four mana, this thing becomes a four, four, uh, which is very strong. It's a must deal with threat that pumps your team. And it's a two drop. It's not a lot. Battlecry Goblin, another good one. Two mana for a two, two. Goblins you control, including itself, get plus one, plus zero, and haste until end of turn. There's there's quite a few goblins in this set. There's a lot of goblin tokens and things as well. But uh, Pack Tactics, uh, this one gets to create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking, which you can then, of course, pump later. So Also very good. For two drop especially. So these two two drops are very strong. Another two drop. Intrepid Outlander, it's a 2-3 reach for 2, uh, which is already really good stats. Uh, more of a defensive creature, but still really good stats. Uh, and then when you uh, pack tactics it, you get to venture into the dungeon. Over and over and over again. So, very strong as well. Synergy pieces. I think Hobgoblin Captain is going to be huge for this deck. There's a card called, I think it's called Hulking Bugbear, which is 3-mana, uh, 3-3 three three, three haste. So you play Hobgoblin Captain on 2, the 3-3 three, three haste on 3, a swing with both, that's pack tactics, and this thing becomes a 3-1 first strike, and you're swinging for 6 damage on turn 3, which is how I think this deck gets broken, busted, insane. You see a pair of goblins, so this helps pump your team, which is another big part of pack tactics. Maybe you don't have uh, 6 power on the board, uh, so you need to pump up your team to get there. Uh, if you don't, you can also make two Red Goblin creature tokens, which also will add to pack tactics, of course, if you're able to attack with them, right? If you attack with those two Goblin tokens in Targnar, uh, they become um, two ones, right? 
Uh, you meet in a tavern, tavern, another pump spell, four mana to give all your creatures plus two, plus two, just enables those big alpha strikes that pack tactics is going to want to do. And also you have an alternate mode there. Uh, these are going to be, of course, as any gruel deck is, very creature heavy. So you look at the top five cards of your library, any number of creatures, put them into your hand. So oftentimes in a gruel deck, you'll have 17 plus creatures. So Very strong as well. All right, I think that's it for me. That is the set. Let me know what you thought. Thanks, folks.